Well, good afternoon, good afternoon, and good afternoon. Welcome to I Am My Sister's Keeper. I am your host, Miss Terry Penny. How are you guys today on this beautiful, beautiful Tuesday? I hope that you guys had a restful night's sleep. I hope that y'all woke up in your right frame of mind and good spirit. I hope you had a song in your heart as you got up this morning and praised and thanked God for waking you to see this day that he created. Um, I woke up to the sun shining in my face this morning and feeling all good. And now <laughs> the clouds then came in a little and the sun then died down some. So, y'all, we look like we might be getting some rain. I hope not because when it rains in Milwaukee, it snows. The snow just melted. We still have a little snow left. So I'm just hoping that we don't get the rain and it just pass us on by. So, how have you guys been doing? I hope that you all um, have been doing your studies. I hope y'all been doing your studies because uh, studies yesterday was good. I hope y'all been doing your studies because uh, yesterday was wonderful. Y'all, we we learned about brotherly love, the Church of Philadelphia. Y'all, we got one more church to go. One more church to go. And we will be done with the churches. So, oh, excuse me. I've been drinking coffee, y'all. Y'all, I get up. I don't care what time of day, I get up. I got to have my cup of joe. I got to have my cup of joe. I can't function without my coffee. Some of y'all know how that feels. Some of y'all know how that feels. Today, we're going to go even further into the church of brotherly love. Uh, we're going to do Digging for the Truth, the Church of Philadelphia, and what was Jesus' message to the church in Philadelphia in Revelations. And as y'all know, um, yesterday I read all the verses from the King James Version. That's the Bible I study from. And I also use the reference books, uh, the MacArthur Bible Commentary, which goes along with the King James Version. And the Haley's Bible Handbook that goes along with the King James Version because they all collaborate together. They just go into a, a deeper part of the verses. They kind of break the verses down. And then, yesterday I also read the history of Philadelphia, which also coincided with the King James Version because all of it stems off the scriptures. Digging for the truth and the uh what is what was Jesus' message to the church of Philadelphia in Revelation? All of these, all this information I have goes with the scriptures in the Bible. And when you if you if you're paying attention and listening then you know that every printout that I read is basically saying the same thing. And then they all are coincide with the King James Version. So what he had me do is he had me take where different people have broke down the verses 
written it out where I can print it out, read them to you guys, and still it'll take you exactly to where it is in the book of Revelations. All the reference verses that come off these printout sheets that I give you guys take you directly to the Bible that take you directly to Revelation. So, all of this locks in together. So, I, I'm, it's not like I'm taking you here and there and there and here and it's talking about 50 different things. I'm taking you here and there and there and here, but it's all coming back to one thing. And that's that verse that we read. So, just so y'all know that. Um, let me move my cups out the way. Pull this over here. So, we're going to go before the Father. And um, we're going to send up a prayer. And we're going to ask... Him and his son, Jesus Christ, to come down and join us. And we're going to get started. And y'all got to excuse me, because I didn't mean to say Oh, God. I left out the two most important things. Come on. Come on. What is she doing? Thank you. There we go. Hey, big brother. I know you're on here for a short time. So let us go before the throne. Heavenly Father, we come to you to say first and foremost, thank you. Thank you for watching over us and protecting us last night as we rested. Thank you for watching over and protecting our families and our homes from the seen and the unseen. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for waking us up to see this beautiful day that you again created. Father, we just want to thank you for blessing us with our daily needs. Thank you for giving us traveling grace and mercy as we go on the highways and byways to and fro our destinations. Father, we just want to ask that you and your son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit come and sit with us again today on this beautiful Tuesday as we go into your words and study. Father, I ask that you just be with us. Give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of what we are studying, Father. Father, I ask that you hide me behind the cross. Don't let them see me, Father. But let them see your son, Jesus, that is in me. Don't let them hear my voice. But let them hear the voice of your son. As he comes forward, Father, and teach your gospel. Father, I ask that the eyes and ears, the hearts and minds, the soul and spirit of all your children that are watching, listening. Will receive the message that you have for them today. Father, I thank you for allowing me to do this. It's an honor and a privilege to serve you and to serve your children. Father, I pray that this be pleasing and acceptable to you. And I pray to you this prayer. I seek your kingdom and your faith. I declare and decree all things. And I thank you. I thank you for answering and hearing all our prayers and cries and supplication. I pray to you this prayer in your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen and amen.
Okay. Digging for the truth. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what was Jesus' message to the church in Philadelphia in Revelations. I'm going to do that one first. Then we're going to do digging for the truth. Because digging for the truth is a little longer than this one. What was Jesus' message to the church in Philadelphia in Revelations? Revelations 3, 7 through 13 records Christ's message to the sixth of the seven churches addressed in Revelations chapter 2 and 3. The Philadelphian church is the recipient of this letter. Philadelphia was a city in Asia Manor, modern-day Turkey, on the Imperial Post Road, and an important trade route. Now, when we read Digging for the Truth, it's going to go in more detail of that. It says the message is from the Lord Jesus Christ through an angel or a messenger. It says, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write. This was not John. Per this, is when, this was not John's personal message to these believers. It was a message from the Lord who identifies himself as him who is holy and true, who holds the keys of David. What he opened, no one can shut, and what he shut, no one can open. This description of Jesus emphasizes his holiness, his sovereignty, and his authority. The reference to the key of David is an Allusion to the Masonic prophecy of Isaiah 22, 22. Jesus is the one who opens and shut, and no one can say him nay. Jesus affirms the church positive actions. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. That was Revelation 3, 8. The church of Philadelphia was weak in some respect, yet they had remained faithful in the face of trial because of this. The Lord promised them an open door of blessing. Jesus' letter then condemns the enemies of the, the Philadelphian believers. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Those who persecute, hmm, persecuted. I'm sorry. Those who persecuted the believers, the persecutors were religious hypocrites in this case, would one day realize Christ loves his children. The church of Philadelphia would be victorious over its enemies. Now, that should make us, the believers, the saints, the children of God today, that should fill us with nothing but joy and happiness. To know that he's going to make our enemies fall at our feet. To know that the people that turned on us, that begin to hate us, that begin to treat us like, well, <laughs> dirt, 
Like we had a disease. Like we didn't exist. Hatred. Those enemies who say that they are of God but are not. They are liars. The fake Christians. All those that came against us. They told us that we weren't going to amount to anything. By doing this. That there is no God to serve. Those people, our enemies, those that are against God. Not necessarily against us. But against the word of God that is in us. That is against the gospel, the teachings, the works of the Father. The enemies of the Philadelphians. He said... I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. So you see, when people turn on us and, and, and do all these things to us and call us all kinds of names, let that roll off of you. Let that roll off of you. Don't, don't even take it to heart. You just look at them, smile, and you continue to love and pray for them. Because God has you. Jesus got your back. Jesus is going to make sure that everything that they did to you in his name, they're going to pay for it. It says, Jesus encouraged the Philadelphian believers regarding his future coming. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of the trial that is going to come upon the world, the whole world, to test those who live on the earth. That was a clue right there. Trial. I will also keep you from the hour of the trial. The trial and tribulations. I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so no one will take your crown. The church faithful endurance will serve as a blessing. Jesus would take them to be with him before the coming tribulations. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. He also exhorts them to remain faithful because this will lead to rewards in the afterlife. Based on this and other passages, many Bible interpreters conclude that the rapture is an event distinct from the second coming of Christ. The fact that the Philadelphians are promised to be preserved from the time of the tribulations corresponds with the pre-tribulation -tribul view of the rapture. They were promised that they would not have to face the trials and tribulations. That when he come and gather his people, those that were in the grave will go first. And all those Philadelphians today that are still living, walking with Christ, Still holding fast and faithful and enduring to the end. Will be called up. It says. 
Jesus provides a final promise to the believers in Philadelphia and to all believers. Listen to that again. Jesus provides a final promise to the believers of Philadelphia and to all believers. That's me, you, and everyone else. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. Which is coming down from out of heaven from my God. I will also write on him my new name. God promised that he will not just honor overcomers by erecting a pillar in their name in heaven, as was the custom in Philadelphia. He will make them pillars in the spiritual temple of God, the new Jerusalem. So those who struggle with weakness, Jesus makes everlasting pillars in the house of God. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Philippians 4.13 Jesus' word of comfort certainly would have been a blessing to the Philadelphians who had faithfully stood for Christ in their pagan culture. Remember, all the other surrounding churches, except Samarina, were pagan worshipers. His words continue to serve as an encouragement to the faithful believers of today. The promises that he made to the people of Philadelphia was that if they stayed faithful and endured to the end, that he will make their enemies Their footstool. They will bow down to him. Bow down to them. And they will know that they were loved by God. Just like if we stay endured and faithful to the end. Our enemies will bow down. And know that God loved us. And when the trials and tribulations come, when he start rapturing his children up to him, when he start calling his children up to him, we will be there too. And we will not have to be down here to endure the pain and suffering that this world is going to go through during the trials and tribulations and the great tribulations. Pre-tribulation rapture is when Jesus come and call his children from the grave and those who are living. This is a promise that he made to us that we would not have to suffer through that if we just stay focused on the cross, faithful to the cross, that if our belief in Jesus Christ will stay steadfast and consistent, 
if we trust in the words of our Father in the book that was written, especially for us so we could understand what it is that he is looking for us to do. It tells us what the Ten Commandments in Exodus. It tells us how to love one another. It tells us how to love our husbands. It tells us how to love our wives. It tells us how to raise our children. This book tells us everything we need to know to live in this life. But so again, I say this, so many of us do not read our Bibles because we're too busy doing other things. But when the trials and tribulations come, a lot of y'all going to be sitting up here crying and boohooing. And you already know what you had to do. Y'all going to be sick. I'm telling you, you're going to be singing them coulda, shoulda, woulda blues. When you can start right now. Let me tell y'all, I brought, I bought my grandkids the uh, Action Bible for Children. And my daughter-in-law tells me, oh, they, they go in them books and they study on their own. They, they, they love them books. The more they read and study those books, the closer it's going to bring them to Christ. That was the best investment I ever made. Investing in my grandkids' souls. I have five grandkids. Two boys, I mean three boys and two girls. Now one of them is a is a is 18. He's probably 19 now. So I just bought him a, a regular Bible. But I bought the kids, it's called the Action Bible. If you want, if you want to get your children to reading the Bible, get them the Action Bible. Get them the Action Bible. She said they don't put it down. They, they love to read it. It's, y'all, we, we got to do something. Our kids are being raised by YouTube and, and, and Nintendo and, 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 uh, Snapchat and WhatsApp and, and uh, all kinds of stuff on the internet. And, and, and we're doing nothing about it. How about you take 30 minutes of your time and get into the word with them? How are you going to get to know the promises of the Father if you're not willing to pick up his book? How are you how are you going to get to know the love of Jesus if you don't pick up the book? How is you going to know how to Treat the situation that you're in if you don't read his words.
The people of Philadelphia trusted Christ with everything. These people went through earthquakes and still trust in God. Their buildings around them was falling apart and they still trust in God. People was coming at them left and right because of their love for Christ. And they still trust God. I'm just saying. How can you trust God if you don't know God? He gave you a way. Right here. He gave you a way. To know him. Through prayer. Fasting, meditation, worshiping, praising, every day, all day. He gave you a way to know him. So don't be surprised if you stand before him on judgment day and he tell you to leave me for I know you not. Because some of us only come to him when we're in trouble. Some of us only thank him when he sends us something. But nobody wants to do the work that he asks us to do. Digging for the truth. The Church of Philadelphia. Philadelphia was located about 28 miles southeast of Sardius. The city was founded in 189 BC by Adelis Philadelphus, from whom it was named. Some believe that it was so named also because of the love and loyalty existing between Philadelphus and his brother. The king of Lydia. The city was also known as the Capitalist because it was one of the ten cities of the plain. It was sometimes called Little Athens because of the magnificence of its public buildings. Its modern Turkish name is Alashir which means the city of God or the exalted city. Philadelphia has thus been given a number of new names. Philadelphia guarded and commanded an important pass through the mountains between the Hermits and the Mendera Valley. It was thus the keeper of the keys to the door or gateway to the eastern highlands with the power to open and close according to the will of the officials. Philadelphia held the keys that open up the gateway to where people can travel to go and buy and sell their goods. They were the gatekeepers. And the officials would let them know, okay, you can let this person in or you can let that person in. It says, through this portal, pass the mail and trade and com commerce of the West to the wide regions of Central and Eastern Lydia. The introduction of Christ in his epistles 
therefore had a forceful meaning to the Philadelphians. God's words was very, very important to these people. He remained, he reminded them of others and more important doors to which he alone holds the key with the power and the authority to open and shut. His words meant so much to these people. That they were diligent followers and believers. And he let them know that he could open up many other doors for them. That everything that he do for them, that their enemies could not take away. Remember, whatever God has for you is for you. It's up to you to accept it. Philadelphia was subject to frequent and severe earthquakes. Trench declared that no city of Asia Minor suffered more are so much from violent and oft recurring earthquakes. And the historian Strabo, who lived between 64 BC, remember we talked about him yesterday, and AD 21 said that Philadelphia was full of earthquakes. That's because they lived directly on the fault line. He may have been there at the time of the great earthquake that destroyed the city in A.D. 17. That was only one of the series of quakes that kept the citizens in a state of fearful expect expectancy. Strabo wrote, Philadelphia has no trustworthy walls. But daily in one direction or another, they kept tottering and falling apart. Their city was slowly being disintegrated by these earthquakes. The inhabitants, however, the people pursued their original purpose ever keeping in mind the writing pain of the ground, the building with a view to counteracting them. Strawball was astonished that the city should ever have been founded in such a locality, and he questioned the sanity of the people for re-entering the ruined city and planning to rebuild to withstand the future shock which were momentarily expected. Every time they had an earthquake, they would go in after the earthquake or the aftershocks and start to rebuild their city. And Starbuck wondered what was wrong with these people. Why do they do that? They know that an earthquake can come at any minute while they rebuilding from the last one. Their faith 
their faith is what kept them there. It was their faith that kept them going. In the midst of everything that they were going through, they still had faith. He felt that when people are driven from a city by earthquakes, they ought to be wise enough never to return. He declared that the walls of the houses were in incessantly open and sometimes one or sometimes another part of the city was experiencing some damage. The citizens therefore lived in constant dread of quaking earth and falling buildings. Because of this situation, the people often fled to the open country and lived in tents or booths. In earthquake season, in order to keep themselves beyond the range of disaster, although the city was often shattered and the migration from its ruins were frequent, so that its citizens lived in constant terror, yet in spite of an ever-present sense of danger, the brave Philadelphians were determined, were determined to make the city Realize the aims for which it was founded. This constant fear of the city of, I mean, I'm sorry. This constant fear of the day of trial when the citizen must flee for their lives made the language employed by Christ very striking. He encourages people with the promise that if they faithfully, that if faithfully, they will one day enter the new Jerusalem, the city of God, where they could dwell safely and go no more out. When the Tartars captured the city of Philadelphia in 1403, it is said that they built a wall around it with the bodies of their victims. Listen to that again. Listen to this again. Because of the situation, the people often fled to the open country and lived in tents or booths in earthquake season in order to keep themselves beyond the range of disaster. Although the city was often shattered and the migration from its ruins were frequent, so that its citizens lived in constant terror, yet it spot, yet in spite of an ever-present sense of danger, the brave Philadelphians were determined to make the city realize the aims for which it was founded. This consists const, this constant fear of the day of trial. When the citizens must flee for their lives, made the language employed by Christ very striking. Verses 10 and 12. Remember what 10 and 12 says in Revelation? It says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world. To try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem which cometh down out of the heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name.
that is what they were holding on to. That promise right there kept them going back into that city to rebuild it. To put their lives in jeopardy of being swallowed up by the earth or having a building collapse on them. It was the promise that Jesus made. That kept them going. That made them stay in a place that was so dangerous. That it, even though they were in fear, they never doubted. They never quit. They didn't run. They stayed. And, and ha. <laughs> How is it that we're living today, okay? We're in modern times. And as soon as, 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 as we get a paper cut, we're ready to give it up. As soon as an argument break out, we're ready to give it up. We come up with so many excuses of why we don't do things. Why we don't stick with things. Oh, well, see, they're going to sit up there and have me working all these hours. And they can't pay me for these hours. So what am I going to stay there for? I'm going to find me something else. We have to go through the things in life in order to get the blessings that God has for us. We can't sit here. If, if we sit here and, 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 and give up on everything and just stop and quit, we'll never do, we'll never accomplish anything. We, we'll never. But what's the word I'm looking for? What's the word I'm looking for, Father? What's the word I'm looking for? We will never, if we can sit here and we continue to give up and quit because things don't go our way, We would never know what a true blessing is. We would never know what God has for us on that other side. If we sit there and if we take, we work, if they want to work, give us the hours to work, we work the hours. Don't complain. Don't whine about the money. Do what you do. He said, work as if you're working for me. Do things as if you're doing them for the Father. Do it as if you're you're, you're glorified. You do it to glorify Him, not for you. If, if it's there, they're giving you more hours to work and you haven't gotten a pay raise yet, hold tight. Work those hours. See where it ends. But don't sit up there and get upset and get mad because you got to work extra hours and, and, oh, and the money's not right. Baby, how you know that as soon as you sit there and quit that job because of that, how you know you didn't lose out on that blessing for that pay raise that could have been 
just what you needed. That pay raise could have came exactly the time that you needed. God does things on a time frame. He doesn't do it when you want it done. He, he puts things in a path in your path that happens. He, he gave the hours to see if you were going to actually work them or was you going to sit there and complain. But see, if you just sat there and worked the hours, no matter how long it took, if it took months, e even years, and you study working those hours, not complaining, doing your job, and, and doing it to the best of your ability, like you doing it for the Father himself, and you taking all kinds of craps and stuff with this, even though you're the one working those extra... At the end, at the end, he he would have made things happen. He, he would have had that blessing that was there for you because you endured. You 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 stay consistent. You didn't quit. You didn't give up. You didn't complain. You didn't whine. You stayed. Faithful and you stay true to the promises that he made. I'm going to say this again. He's not going to put too much on your plate that you cannot handle. He's not going to put you in a situation that he has not already prepared for you. The people of Philadelphia knew that God had already prepared something for them. All they had to do was stay faithful, stay true, stay on that course that he had for them. And what was that promise that if they stayed in door, they were living on a fault line where there was an earthquake that could happen at any second. Most people would have left that area and moved to somewhere else, but they did not move. They didn't budge. They were surrounded by paganism, but their faith in God stayed true. And what God said, he was going to open a door. For them to go through. All they had to do was. Stay faithful. Stay consistent. What did he say he was going to do? Let's read that again. He said. Because. Thou hast kept the word of my patience. I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown. No matter what we go through in this time, in this world, in this moment, in this sex, second, no matter what the enemy throws at us, no matter what anyone come at us with, stay faithful. Stay focused on the cross. Believe in the promises that Jesus made on the cross when he shed his blood for our sins. And trust in God's words. The, the Philadelphian message. I'm sorry. Let me finish reading. It says... Yet in spite of the 
ever-present sense of danger, the brave Philadelphians were determined to make the city realize the aims for which it was employed by Christ, very striking. He encouraged his people with the promise that if faithful, they would one day enter the new Jerusalem, the city of God, where they could dwell safely and go no more out. When the Tartars captured the city of Philadelphia in 1403, it is said that they built a wall around it with the bodies of their victims. Those that were lost, that had been killed, that sacrificed their, who lives were sacrificed either by the earthquake or those that were coming against them. Their bodies were used to keep the Tartars out. The Philadelphian message. This message reveals the best spiritual condition of any of the seven churches. The letter is addressed to a small but exceptional company who had remained faithful. In the midst of a large number who had failed. The message indicates a commendable change for the better from the Sardanian's condition of spiritual deadness. Remember, Sardius was overconfident, conceited. They thought that nothing could happen to them. They, they were the richest. And the soil and currency. They thought they were in, they thought no army could ever conquer them. And they were conquered twice in the middle of the night. And when the earthquake of AD 17 hit Sardius, it destroyed the city. The, to the Philadelphians had come a renewal of life and love and missionary zeal. A resurrection from spiritual death, a return to the first love of the early Ephesian period. Suffering Samaria and tried Philadelphia are the only two of the seven churches that received no rebuke. And Samirna Church still exists today. The Philadelphian Church still exists. All the other seven of all the other five churches were destroyed. But we know what came out of Pergamus. And Thyateria. And that's the Catholic Church. We know what came out of Sardius. And that's the Protestant Church. It says, and with Thyateria are the only ones that remains of the original seven. The present city has a population of about 15,000 a third of whom are professed Christians. Philadelphia held out against the conquering Turks along after the other cities of Asia, except Samaria, had fallen. After being besieged by a powerful Ottoman army till the inhabitants were reduced to a verge of starvation, they held out for 11 years, 11 years before yielding in A.D. 1390, surrendering on excellent terms. The courage and hero heroism of the Christian defenders of the city aroused the admiration of the historian Gibbon who wrote 
in the loss of Ephesia, the Christian deplored the fall of the first angel, the extension of extinction of the first candlestick of the revelation. Remember, Christ told Ephesia that if they did not repent and change and come back to their first love, which was the cross, that their light will be put out and their candlestick will be removed from the candle holder. That was the first church we studied. Of the rebel, it says the destruction is completed. The circus and the three stately theaters of Laodicea are now people with wolves and foxes. Sardis is reduced to a miserable village. The god of Mo Momet, re oh, I'm sorry, hold on. Yeah, Momet, without a revealed, a rival, or a son, is evoked in the Mosquette of Thyateria and Pergamus. Philadelphia alone has been saved by prophecy of courage. At a distance from the sea, forgotten by the emperors, encompassed on all sides by the Turks, her valiant citizens defend their religion and freedom above fourscore years. At a length catap capital, capitulated with the proudest of the Ottomans among the Greek colonies and churches of Asia, Philadelphia is still erected a column in the scene of ruins a pleasing example that the path of honor and safety, honor and safety, whoop, may sometimes be the same. Gibbon doubtless referred to the lone pillar that for so many years stood like a sentinel aim, um, aim at the ruins of the ancient city. I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. Is that a coincidence? That this ancient city, this church, that stood for Christ, that stood for the gospel of God, that stood in the faith of the cross, has one pillar. That is standing to this day. In fact. Remember yesterday. Yesterday when we was reading. About it. I showed you the picture. This is the pillar. Remember this picture I showed you yesterday. This is the pillar. That you will see. If you ever traveled, ever traveled, hold on, let me see, let me get it where y'all can actually see it. That is the pillar that still stands today that represents the church of Philadelphia. Just want y'all to see it. Make sure y'all see it. This was built on a fault line that had many earthquakes. It says,
Okay. It says, okay, Gibbon doubtless refers to the lone pillar that so far many years stood like a sentinel aim at the ruins of the ancient city. I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God is the divine promise to the Christian victor. The Philadelphian period, the era of brotherly love came as the result of a great rival and a Protestant. The Protestant, Protestantism. Now remember, that was the Sardius Church. The, okay, the period covered the latter part of the 18th and the first half of the 19th century. Now, y'all, if y'all notice, that's getting kind of close to us because, hey, I was born in 1966. Okay. It says, until the, the beginning of the Laodicean state in 1865, Joseph Seitz declared that the Philadelphian era was marked by a closer adherence to the written word and more frequently among Christians. But it's now rapidly giving place to the Laodicean half warmness. The Philadelphian condition of brotherly love and missionary zeal must again prevail in the remnant who are to be translated when Christ return. It says the message shows clearly that this period reached to the end. It began with the great foreign mission movement, which sent a revival through the Protestantism and ushered in an era of love for both God and man, such as had to be known since the apostate days. Love for the elder brother always led to the love for the other brothers. This is the love that was lost during the Ephesian period. It is not fully regained till just before Jesus returned. Its return to the church will bring a repetition of Pentecostal power. Those who escape from the dominion of Jezebel and the spiritual deadness of Sardius began to remember how they have received and heard and repented. Remember, Jesus told Sardius in their letter, in his letter to them, that that little light that was left to protect it, they needed to repent and to go back to the cross Because if they didn't, he was going to be like a thief into the night. They don't know which hour that he was going to come. And judgment was going to be brought upon them and the city. Now, there were people who escaped. And it was people who realized they heard God's warning. I mean, Jesus' warning. And they did something about it. They repented. And they went back to their first love, which was the cross. Now, here's the question. God sends us warnings to test our faith. He does little things to test are we going to keep believing and trusting in him or are we going to run to the world for help? When we live in sin and, and we're doing wrong, he, this is 
why he gives us free will. He don't force himself upon us or his ways or his words upon us. He let us choose to come to him. But when you sit here and you continue to sin and continue to do what you want to do and you continue to hurt his people, you continue to ignore his warnings, you continue to live in this world, you continue to let the enemy have control of your mind. He's going to send someone that's going to cross your pathway and say, hey, what you did was wrong. You hurt her. You hurt him. You hurt that child. Stealing that money was not right. Stealing that car was not right. Because see, the Holy Spirit will speak to you and let you know, hey, you're not supposed to do that. Hey, you know that's wrong. Hey, you shouldn't be in there. Hey, you should not be messing with that 12-year-old little girl. You should not be trying to holler at that little boy. You shouldn't be doing the things that you're doing. The Holy Spirit is going to convict you when you're in your sins. But see, some of us got it down packed to where we don't even hear that. Because we didn't got comfortable in what we're doing. We're going to do what we want to do. So that little voice that talks to you, you put that on the back burner. So if that don't work, okay, okay, I'm going to send somebody that you know to tell you. So he can use your wife, your husband, your mother, your father, your daughter, your son, even your five-year-old child to tell you about yourself. Because baby, if he can use a donkey... He can use anyone. To tell you, you need to stop. You, you, what you're doing is, 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 is not good for you. you. You don't need to do all that drinking. You don't need to be doing all them drugs. You, you, you know, just trying to help you. But you don't listen either. Your, the, your ears become deaf. See, that's how Satan wants it. He don't want you to hear that you're doing wrong. He don't, because see, he knows that once that spirit gets in you, that, that makes you start thinking, well, you know what? Maybe I do need to stop this. Maybe I need to, to slow down. Maybe I need to, to go to church more often. Maybe I need to start paying my tithes. Maybe I, see when the maybes get to going in your head, Satan says, no, no, I, I need you to get out of that and come on back over here. But some of us don't know the words, the promises, the love of God. That if we listen to him and repent of our sins, that we can be washed in the blood of the Lamb and cleansed. We can be given a new mindset, a, a, a new heart, a, a new soul, a new everything. In fact, when we repent and, and, and do this, he takes the blinders that Satan has put over your eyes and take it off. And you can see this world for what it truly is. 
You can see who's truly running this world. And the, your journey starts to begin because see, then he start moving people out of your life. He start taking the toxins out of your life. He starts taking the stress and the headaches out of your life. That don't mean you ain't going to still get them. Because he said, we going to cry. We going to hurt. We going to suffer. But if we endure to the end, our rewards is in heaven. If we stay focused and, and, and centered on the cross, we will make it through these dark times. And if we remember, and this is the most important thing that people forget. He's always, always with us. He said, I will never leave nor forsake you. That means it don't matter what the world says. It don't matter what the enemy does. It don't matter how your family feels. It don't matter how your husband or your wife feel. It don't matter how man feels towards you in general. Long as you know that your father is walking with you. Everybody else's opinions can be their own opinions. Because they're going to walk, they're going to talk, they're going to say what they want to say anyway. And if we have not learned that by now, then something's wrong. They escaped from the false prophetess who was teaching the ways of Jezebel in the church of Sardius. They escaped from the deadness of the church in Sardius. And they began to remember that they had received and heard the warnings of Christ and they repented. We hear his warnings when we sin. He tells us what we have to do when we do this. And all he asks us to do, y'all, is repent. R E P E N T. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And don't say it because you were made to say it. Say it because you mean it. Do it because you want to live right. You, you're tired. I don't see how some of y'all ain't sick and tired of living the way you live. I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't see how some of y'all are not tired of stress and struggle and worryation. And, and I, I just, I don't, I don't see how you're not tired of it. Okay. It says, let me get back into this. Let me get back. Let me, I'm going I'm to get back to this. Let me get back. It says, the arrested reformation was started again. Dead Christ, Christendom, Christendom was mighty, was mightily stirred by great spiritual revivals, bringing renewed life and love and unity. Did you hear that? 
the arrested reformation was started again. The reformation of the church that was supposed to take place in Sardius that did not had now started up somewhere else. The dead Christian was mighty stirred by a great spiritual revival by those who took heed to God's words and repented. Bringing renewed life and love and unity. The church entered upon a program of world evangelism to fulfill the Great Commission. May 31st, 1792, William Carey preached his memorable sermon on foreign missions from Isaiah 54, 2, and 3. This date is reckoned as the birth of the modern mission. And if an exact date can be chosen, it may also mark the beginning of the Philadelphian period of the universal church. Remember, God told the the, the Philadelphians, that he was going to open a door that no one could shut. Philadelphia was a missionary church. A missionary church. It says, and if, okay, the revival movement spread throughout all dominations and broke down many of the barriers that had hitherto separated the different religious sects. The Wesleys and the Whitefields had an important part in this great movement that ushered in the era of brotherly love. Of this moment, movement, one writer said, this early, the prophetic hope was expressed that this uprising of the world's redemption will spread to every Christian bosom, to the Dutch, German, American, and all Protestant churches, till the whole professing world shall burn with the fervent love and labor to spread in every heathen land and sweet savior, savor of the Redeemer's name. Come on, y'all. Come on. All of this started from a church that Jesus Christ told his angel to go tell John to write. Seven churches in book of Revelation. Two churches were the foundation and the startup of the Catholic Church. One church was the foundation and the startup of the Protestant Church. And then one church was the startup of missionary work. Come on. This is what. The, and these were the seven churches. That were going to lead. To the churches of today. Um, Y'all come on. Oh wow. There, this will be ever remembered by us as the era of Christian benevolence. And speaking again of the dawn of the new of this new day, the same author said in January the first of seventeen ninety seven, it could be affirmed concerning the religious fever resulting far and wide. 
Christians in every corner of the land are meeting in a regular manner and pouring out their souls for God's blessing on the world. And again, the effort must successfully made to introduce the gospel to the South Seas have had a most powerful tendency to unite the devoted servants of Christ of every domination in the bonds of brotherly love and to awaken zeal to help the perishing multitudes in our own country. And also the Jews' inspiring letters came to from Basel, which since 1771 had been the seat of a widespread movement to maintain evangelical doctrine and piety. Certain devout German brethren sent their congregation couched, couched in these glowing words. It is like a dawn promising the beautiful day after a dark night. It is the beginning of a new epoch, a pouch for the kingdom of God on earth. In 1797, the first missionaries landed in Tahiti in the South Pacific. All of this, y'all, this is why I this is why I love studying this book. Y'all, let me show y'all. I love studying this book. I love studying this book I, because he takes me so far into it. If you did not dig deep into the studies, it, how would you have known that everything that stems today came from these seven churches? How would you have known? If you didn't ask the Father to Open up your noggins to pour in wisdom and understanding of what you're reading out of here. How would you have known all of this? I am so grateful to him. Oh my gosh, I am so grateful to him. I love him so much. I love him so Oh, I love him so much. I, I love him so much. I love this man so much. I, y'all, I, hey, I. Y'all know how y'all feel when y'all get them the, that 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 diamond necklace and them wedding rings and stuff from y'all boyfriends and husbands and stuff. Well, that's how I feel when I get the knowledge and the wisdom and understanding from my father and my big brother Jesus. I feel like a bride. I feel like I y'all. If there is nothing you, oh my. It just, it just, woo, y'all, y'all, okay, okay, it says, what, <laughs> oh my God, oh my gosh, okay, in 1797, the fifth, the first missionary landed in Tahiti and South Pacific, Robert Morrison went to China in 1807. And Robert Moffat to Africa in 1817. In the same year, John Williams began the work of exploring and Christianizing the South Sea Island races. In 1840, David Livingston began his missionary exploration of Africa. The British and Foreign Bible, Stu Bible Society was organized in 1804, and the American Bible Society, which still exists today, in 1816. Man, come on. 
the multiplication of Bibles in various languages was an essential part of the program of world evangelism that began with the Philadelphia era. Okay, I'm sorry. I need something to drink. Okay, the Second Advent Movement. This great revival of Christian love resulting in a burden for the world evangelism naturally accumulated in the great Second Advent Movement. Church leaders around the world began to study of the prophetic word and almost simultaneously came to the unanimous conclusion that the end of the reign of sin was near and that Jesus would soon return in fulfillment of his promise. In fact, no other conclusion is possible from the study of Bible prophecy. This prophetic investigation centered on the books of Daniel and the revelations and the great sermon of Christ in answer to the question of the disciples. When shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? As recorded in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. And yes, I'm putting all of this in the comment box for you guys to study. Yes. I don't know. Don't, don't start getting that look on y'all face because I already told y'all when we started the book of Revelation, have your paper, your pen, and your Bible with you because we, y'all, yeah. So, I, y'all can get that look off y'all face. It says, on May 19, 1780, the sun was supernaturally darkened in fulfillment of the prophecy. And the predicted shower of fallen meteors followed on the night of November 13th, 1833. Oh, y'all yeah, know I got to look into that. Y'all yeah, know I got to look into that. Thousands of ministers of many denominations began to proclaim the message of the second advent and all Christians were stirred. Based on the 2,300-year time prophecy of Daniel 8 and 9, many came to the conclusion that Christ would return in 1843 and later in 1844. Okay, I'm going to look into that. Y'all know this. See, that's just more studying for me. That would, that Now, I'm going to put it well, all y'all have to do is look, look at the video. And if y'all want to study in this, I, go ahead. Because I know I am. I, I need to look into that. Just like I need to look into this other one right here. It says, there swept over the Christian world the greatest rival since Pentecost. And every apostate Apostolic time. Apostolic time. I can't even talk straight. The believers in the Advent hope were brought into a state of brotherly love and unity and godliness. godliness <sighs> such as had not been known since the beginning of the Christian era. It has been suggested that the Philadelphia period begin in 1798 with the close of the 1,260 years of papal domination. Now, y'all know that the papal, the papacy is the Catholic Church. And reached to the close of the 
2,300 year time prophecy in 1844 when the investigative judgment began in heaven and the Ladosian state of the church was ushered in by the disappointment. Okay, let me uh, let me highlight that. Hold up, hold up. Yep, yep. Okay. The papacy domination which is the Catholic Church. Okay. It says, To the holiest of the seven churches, Christ introduced himself as he that is holy and he that is true, the Holy One of Israel, is speaking to his people. The head of the church lays claim to divinity and every word he speak is true and dependable. His divinity is also proved by the fact that he has the keys of David. Because he is the son of David with the right to occupy his throne. Christ holds the keys to the house of David, which is the kingdom of heaven. Come on now. He has the authority to open and close the heavenly kingdom and decide who can and who cannot enter. All must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Citizenship is possible only through him. When Jesus Christ died upon the cross, that's when he acquired the keys to hell. He controls who goes to hell and who does not. When he ascended to the right hand of the Father in heaven, he acquired the keys to the gate. Only he can open those gates and let you in. So, that means when you stand before Christ on judgment, he either going to open up the gates of heaven and tell them to let you in, or he's going to tell them, open up the gates of hell and let you in. Ain't no in between. It's either or. Here's the thing. Now that you know, now that you know that Christ holds the keys to both heaven and hell, why would you serve the world that the enemy, that Satan is over? Satan can't save you. Satan ain't trying to save you. Satan knows that when all of this is over, him and his people are going straight to hell. Ain't no questions about it. He defied God. He turned on God. Mm. 
when all this is over with. Hell was not meant for God's people. Hell was meant for Satan and his fallen angels that came down with him. But because the keys were taken from him, by God's son that pissed him off even more. So now he's even more mad. So he's going to do everything in his power to entice you to follow him. If y'all don't hear nothing else I say tonight, please hear this. Hell is not the place for you. Hell is not the place that you're supposed to be at. Listen to God's warning. Take heed to what he tells you and repent. Repent. And go back to your first love, the cross. Think about it, y'all. God sent his only son to die on the cross and shed his blood for our sins so that we would not have to face the pits of hell. So that we won't have to face death. Think about that. You living in this world thinking you living your best life, thinking that you got everything in control, thinking that you are the master of your destiny. Satan is telling you all of this for one thing, to make you with a swell head, to build up your ego, to make you overconfident, to make you conceited and vain and boastful. So that you look down your nose on people who don't have, you talk about them, you gossip, you, you do things that you should not be doing, that you know you should not be doing, but you do them anyway. And if you don't repent and listen to that voice in your head that's telling you don't do it, don't go that way, don't say that, don't act like that, don't treat them like that. You're going to join Satan and all his followers in the pit of hell. And then you got the second death that's going to come. When you go to the lake of fire and brimstone. Because Satan is going to be put in that pit of hell for a thousand years. And then he's going to be released because he's going to come and try to drag other people down with him for the last time. But this time it's not going to work. God did not make us to be tortured day and night. I, I I I don't know how in, in any other way to how to tell you this, how to make it more explainable to you. If you choose to keep doing what you're doing and living the way you live it, you're signing a death warrant with Satan. But if you listen. Listen to that voice that's telling you right from wrong. 
and, and, and cut your ties with this world and everything and everyone in it. Focus on the cross that Jesus gave his life on for us and endure. Take the, just whatever Satan throws at you to get you back in there. Tell him no. Stand up to him and say no. And you keep Focusing on that cross. You keep believing that Christ is coming back. And he's going to call you home. And you're going to be a pillar. In God's temple. That doesn't have to go out anymore. That you will be with Jesus forever. That all his promises that he made will come to pass. If you stay focused on it and love your brothers and sisters the way God loves us. Treat them according. Pick up your cross and walk in that path that Jesus walked. Do what it is that you need to do. To help and serve others in need. And receive eternal life and salvation. He told his disciples that he was going to go and make a place for them in heaven. That's a promise for all of us. We all can have a place in heaven. The declaration that Christ has possession of the keys of David with the authority to open and shut is a quotation of the Messianic prophecy of Isaiah 22. I, did I just read that? No. Isaiah 22, 22. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. See also Luke 1, 32 and 33. A key. Is the means of locking and unlocking doors and is therefore a symbol of power and authority. Since the year of 605 BC, when Israel's last independent king, Jehoiakim, was dethroned by Nebuchadnezzar, the house and throne room of David have been closed and locked. Now remember, uh, if you read, that Ezekiel was on the throne. But Ezekiel was not a king. He was not a true king. He was more like a prince. Because the bloodline stopped with Jehoiakim. Ezekiel just made himself king. He wasn't appointed king. The throne of David will remain vacant until he comes who is right, whose right it is. See Ezekiel 23 through 27. Now, y'all know we, I, we, we did a study on Ezekiel. So, I am going to go right now to Ezekiel chapter 21, verse 23 through 27, and I'm going to read that. Ezekiel 21, 
23 through 27. And it says, and it shall come, and, I'm sorry, and it shall be unto them as a false divination in their sight to them who have sworn oaths, but he will call to remembrance the iniquity that they may be taken. Ezekiel. Yep. 21. Yep. 23. Okay. Now, I'm going to read the commentary for that verse because y'all know my King James Version has the commentary and the verse. So it says, and it shall be unto them as a false divination in their sight. Refers to the false prophets in Jerusalem who still continues to preach peace and prosperity, causing the king and the people to believe that Nebuchadnezzar was not going to come to Jerusalem. To them who have sworn oaths, refer to Zedekiah, who had sworn an oath to Nebuchadnezzar, but did, but had dally. Okay, let me tell y'all about this one. See, this, 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 what I, this is what I love right here. Zedekiah. Now, God wanted Zedekiah to make a covenant with Nebuchadnezzar. That way, Nebuchadnezzar will protect. Okay, he would protect them, but Zedekiah, being who he is, decided to make a covenant with Egypt. Now, when Nebuchadnezzar heard this, well, let's just say he was not a happy king. So, the false prophets that were living in uh, what this was Jerusalem, yeah. In Jerusalem, was telling the people that you know nothing was going to happen to them, that God was going to protect them, that Nebuchadnezzar wasn't going to do anything to harm them, and all of that. In fact, they had a wall built around the city. Okay? Stay with me here. When Nebuchadnezzar... Now, I might be reading ahead of this. But when Nebuchadnezzar came against them, he was on their way. But see, what God did was he used Nebuchadnezzar to destroy the heathen nations that was around them. Every every little nation that they came upon, God had him do his thing. Some places he got to take stuff from, some things he couldn't take stuff from. But Nebuchadnezzar, my, he was doing this on his own. But see, God was using him as an instrument of destruction to destroy the heathen nations. So when Egypt was sent their army to come and help, Jerusalem, or Zedekiah, Nebuchadnezzar sent some of his men to meet them. And they went to battle. Now, Zedekiah didn't know this. The people in Jerusalem didn't know this. They thought, hey, our cavalry is coming. They're coming. We got, we're going to be battling. We're going to boom, boom, boom. No, baby. No, no, no. Because the Chaldeans overtook the Egyptians and they ran back home. So now they're on their way back to Jerusalem. All right. So it says to them who have sworn oaths, refer to Zedekiel, who has sworn an oath to Nebuchadnezzar, but had dallied with the Egyptian faction, 
conspiring to throw off their subjection. In fact, Siddiquia went to Babylon in 593 BC, possibly to ally suspicions concerning his involvement with the plot. Therefore, verse 24. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have made your iniquities to be remembered and that your transgressions are discovered. That means Nebuchadnezzar found out. He had snuck behind his back and did what he wasn't supposed to do. Y'all, that's why God sees everything. He hears everything. He knows everything. You can't hide nothing from this man. So stop it. So that in all your doings, your sins do appear. Because I say that you are come to in remembrance. You shall be taken with the hand. This verse further emphasized the treachery of Zedekiah. The iniquities and transgressions and the sin was this breach of the oath of allegiance taken in the name of Jehovah. The plural of majesty is used here to emphasize that great transgressions and that great sin. Verse 25 says, And you profane wicked prince of Israel, whose days is come when iniquity shall have an end. The Holy Spirit calls Zedekiah a wicked prince. Not king, prince of Israel. 26, thus says the Lord God, remove the diadem and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him who is low and abase him who is high. Remove the diadem refers to the mitry of the high priest who will no longer have a temple nor an avenue for his service. And take off the crown refers to the throne of Judah being abolished by Nebuchadnezzar. The military and the crown shall alike pass away, taken from their unworthy wearers. Zedekiah not only did something in the name of Jehovah, he the file the crown the throne of david his iniquities and transgression brought death and captivity upon the people 27 says i will overturn 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 it and it shall be no more until he come Whose right it is, and I will give it to him. Y'all, the purpose of all of this that we are going through, that we are enduring, is a gift that the Father is giving to his Son. Because Jesus Christ died upon the cross for our sins, gave his life willingly. He did not complain. He did not whine. He didn't do any of that. He was the sacrificial lamb for mankind. The father is giving his son the throne of David. Here on earth as in heaven. See what if you if you get in there and you do the studying and, and you get in there and you start under asking for understanding and start understanding what it this is, all of this stuff has to happen. The 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 hurricanes, the the earthquakes, the famine, the pestilence, the trials and tribulations. Satan has to have his moment because see once he is destroyed, that is a wrap. Evil has to be abolished off the face of the earth. And everything that goes with it. 
once the earth and the heaven has been cleansed and cleaned, and then it is ready to be given to the Son of God as a gift for what he did. Come on, peep. Come on, y'all. Saints, believers, this is the time for us to be rejoicing. We are the gift. That is going to be given to the Son of God when He comes and claim. Y'all don't hear me though. Y'all don't hear me though. Y'all don't hear me though. Pick up your books. Pick up the books. Pick up your books and start studying. Just start learning about the Father and His Son and what all of this truly means. We are His people. God was going to destroy. Mankind, he did it before with the flood. He flooded everything. He killed everything except the people that was on the ark with Noah. He made a promise when he put that rainbow up in the sky that he was not going to do that again. He was not going to destroy the earth again. He didn't say mankind. He said the earth. But Jesus stepped in and said, let me help him. He wanted us. He loved us that much that he told his father, send me down there. Because he didn't want to see us perish. If Jesus Christ had not did what he did on the cross when he did it. Y'all have to really. Y'all. Do y'all really understand that. We could not have. We wouldn't have been here. Do y'all understand. He could have destroyed us. Just like that. But because we are so selfish and in denial, it don't bother us. It... I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. Returns, I mean, refers to Judah being destroyed as a nation and especially its supreme authority and its throne never again being established. That means they would never have a king ever, ever, ever again. At least not until he come who right it is. Israel. A king. A true king. They have never had. The throne was shut down. Sealed up. Boarded up. Blocked up. This is the despised Jesus of Nazareth who will return. To him shall the diadem be given. Who right it is. Meanwhile, God overturns all effort to give that crown to another.
<laughs> Many. Y'all. He said no one will sit on that throne again except my son. The same one that y'all sit here and play with his intelligence. Y'all excuse me, my baby. She is she is going through some things. I'm trying to Tape up the page because they the pages are ripping. They got I y'all, it's it's just she just oh and I love her. And I I I I, I wanna keep using her, but I mean her pages are just ripping. They just they're ripping. And y'all she <laughs> I thought my body was getting old. No, baby. My girl here. But that was Ezekiel. Chapter 21. Verses 23 through 27. And it's going to be also in the comment box. For y'all to study. It says the Philadelphia message indicates that the time is near when Christ, the son of David, is about to take his rightful place on the long, unoccupied throne of Adam and David. We are told that this will take place at his second advent. Matthew 25, verse 31 through 34. Oh, me in his chair. There are several other doors that Christ alone can open and shut. The door of the tomb, the keys of death and the grave are in the keeping of him who is the resurrection and the life. Revelations chapter 1 verse 18. When the Philadelphian message applies to the church, the time of the re resurrection of the righteous is drawing near. The door into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, which was opened in 1844 at the close of the 2,300 years. This door into the final phase of the, midi of the meditorial ministry of Christ is mentioned in Revelations 4, 1, 11, 18, and 19. The door of the missionary opportunity, Paul said that when he visited Troas or Taurus, Troas, to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened unto me of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Paul and Barnabas related to the church of Antioch. How God had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. That's us. That's us. Acts 14, 27. Philadelphia had the power to open and close the door through the mountains, reaching to the cities of the great tableland of Asia. The Philadelphian period of Christian is that of the open door of foreign missions. It was the beginning of the modern missionary age.
when the door of the kingdom of heaven is to be opened wide to all nations, during this period, a divine hand began to open the hereto closed mission fields of the world so that the gospel commission could be finished and the prophecy of Revelation 4, 14, 16 through 14 fulfilled. When the door of the kingdom of heaven is to be opened wide to all nations, during this period, a divine hand began to open the here to close commission fields of the world so that the gospel commission could be finished and prophecy of Revelation 14, 6 and 14 filled. The door of probation which will be closed when Christ completes his priestly mission and becomes the Lord, the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Christ alone through his atoning death has the authority to open and close the gates of paradise. Jesus says, strive to enter in at the straight gate for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Luke 13, 24. A lot of us going to try to get in, but will not be able to. Just like the virgins. Five were able to get married. Five were not. Okay. Faithful remnant. Y'all, we might not be able to finish this. This uh, whatever we don't finish tonight, we'll finish up tomorrow. And then we'll start the study guide. Study guide. Faithful remnant. Some believe that Philadelphia not only means brotherly love, but also faithful remnant. The Philadelphian constitute the faithful remnant of the universal church. Nine who will be translated when Jesus comes. The statement for thou hast a little strength has been rather difficult to explain. It seems that the open door of missionary opportunity was set before them because they had a little strength. The only spiritual strength left in Christendom, the Sardinians were wholly dead and powerless. Now God had found a people with a little strength for missionary endeavors they have responded to the appeal to be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. They were doubtless also conscious of their weakness and therefore qualified to do service for Christ. They were not overconfident like the Sardanians or self-satisfied like the Lidocians. Their little strength led them to rely on the word and power of God. Others take the position that the reference has to do with their small numbers and material weakness. Now remember, most of the people of Philadelphia, Philadelphia had them passed away because of the earthquakes. Most of them were swallowed up by the earthquakes. Most of them died in, in their homes. So it was a few of them that were still left that called Philadelphia their home. It says, Trench declares that they were a little flock poor in worldly goods and of small account in eyes of men. 
The former seems to the more probable explanation. The first qualification for service in the cause of Christ is a recognition of our spiritual poverty. The promise that those who claim to be Jews but were rather of the synagogue of Satan would be made to worship at the feet of the true Israelites and to know that God had loved them was an even better promise than a similar one made to Samaritan. In Samaritan letter, an assurance was given that the enemies of Christ would not prevail against the church, but here the promise is that the church would prevail against her enemies, who made hypocritical pretentious of being God's chosen people, it is a solemn warning against apostasy. These people claimed they were God's people. But yet, they did things to those who truly were God's people. They did not live in a godly manner. They, their, their faith was not in the cross. Sounds familiar? We have church folks today that claims they are God's children. They are believers in Christ. But they don't live a Christ life. They don't have a relationship with Christ. So they don't treat people the way they should treat people. And they don't act the way they should act as Christ's people. It says the Jews bitterly prosecuted those of their nation who became Christians and treated them as the outcast of Israel. Because remember, in uh Ephesia, some of the Jews were on the side of the Romans and they were killing their own people. Remember Balaam, or yeah, Balaam, who was a prophet of God, who got greedy for power and money and prestige to where he told Balak, Balak how to trip up the Israelite people. And that's to put women in front of them. He told them to get prostitutes to seduce the Israelite men. And they had yeah. They ate meat of sacri that was sacrificed to the idols, and they were having unmarital sex. And that's how they angered God. Because they thought they was celebrating a feast of peace between the people. But what it was, yeah. And Balaam set this up so he can get paid. So he can impress those people. The, prof, the false prophetess that was in Pergamos was teaching the ways of Jezebel. And all those that were religious leaders and in the congregation of the church was starting to lean more towards what she was teaching. The only two churches that did not falter 
was Samariner and Philadelphia. These two churches stayed under the protection of Christ. It says they were put out of the synagogue and excluded from the temple and its service. And even from the city of Jerusalem, which had long been the city of God. Now the true Messiah who has the authority to open and close the doors into the fold of the true Israel amidst genuine, genuine Christians as the only true Jews. And Exclude their opponents. He promises the prosecuted Christians an entrance into a entrance into the New Jerusalem, which he calls the city of my God, and from which they will go no more out. All will someday acknowledge that the love of Christ is centered on those who are Israelites indeed and faithful of all nations and the faithful of all nations, which means Jews and Gentiles. Y'all. <laughs> I don't know what to say that Y'all, this right here. Oh, y'all. Oh, Lord. Whew. Y'all, me in this chair. Y'all. Every time I get comfortable, I feel like it just... just. But anyhow, uh, y'all, this, this is, this is some good, this, this is some good stuff. Y'all, this is some good stuff. Uh, I'm going to put in... What I'm going to do is... I'm going to just go ahead and I'm going to put in all of the reference verses for this. And that way when we finish up tomorrow, y'all will have everything already to study by. But this was a this was a good study tonight. This was a good study. Y'all, we, we learned some stuff. We learned some stuff. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let you guys go and enjoy the rest of your night with your family, your loved ones, your friends, your hubbies and your wifeies. And we're going to pick up the rest of this, which ain't that much left of it, tomorrow. And then we will start on the... I hope y'all enjoying this. I, I really do. I hope y'all are getting as much out of this as I am. Because I, I am learning some stuff that just... Yeah. So, tomorrow we're going to do, well, we're going to finish up that and then we'll start the lessons from the church eras, the Philadelphia, the grand pattern, and then we'll start the study guide after that. So... And then once we do that, I have the summary for the Philadelphian church. And then we get to go into the last church, which is Lodicea. So, and y'all, I'm, I'm just, I'm telling y'all now, um, 
see who verse 17 i mean chapter 17 y'all that's some mix we y'all okay i'm gonna just hold out until y'all get we get to it i ain't gonna say nothing but we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna go to the throne and we're gonna thank the father and his son for joining us tonight and uh we are we just gonna go ahead and i'm gonna put this stuff in for y'all Heavenly Father, we come to you to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to hear the teachings again, to learn more of your teachings, to, to, to dive deeper into your words, to, whew, to learn things, Father, that we have never learned before. Or even begin to phantom that had took place then. Or now, or how it even came about. Father, I just want to say thank you. I just, I got to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who once again stepped in and taught an excellent lesson and, and just broke it down for us so we can understand it. And thank you for your Holy Spirit that came and did what it did best, Father. And, and that is just open up the minds of all those who were listening and hearing. And that will watch you later, Father. I, I ask that your Holy Spirit just, as soon as they start the video... That it just opens them up. Father, I just, I thank you. I, I thank you for this information. I thank you for this time that you came down to spend with us. I thank you for this time, Jesus, that you came and, 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 and taught us. And, and help us to understand what we're about to go through. And how we have to be ready and prepare for it. I, th I thank you for showing us the directions and instructions that we have to follow. Because if you didn't do this and, and, and didn't come in and talk to us about it, we will be lost. So thank you. Father, I pray that this was pleasing and acceptable to you. I pray that my brothers and sisters who watched it would meditate and, 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 and look into it themselves and pick up your book and study. It is so much that needs to be understood and done in, in a short period of time. Thank you again for using me to do this for you. From your daughter, from a daughter to a father, I appreciate everything you've done to prepare me for this. I am grateful for everything that you do to have me ready. And I love you for being the dad that you are. Because if you did not love your children the way you did, we wouldn't be here today. You wouldn't even have a need for a trial and tribulations and a rapture. Because you could have just took all of us out and redid everything. You could have just had animals on this earth. And no people. 
and just called your saints from the grave. Thank you, Father, for being the loving, kind, merciful, and gracious God that you are. I ask, Father, that you watch over my brothers and sisters as they spend their times with their family, loved ones, and friends. I ask that you give them traveling grace and mercy on the highways and byways as they go to and fro their destination. I ask that you watch over them, Father, as they lay their heads down tonight to rest. I ask that you be with my brothers and sisters who are in foreign lands and country who are being persecuted, abused, and mistreated in your name. I ask that you be with those who are here, who are being abused, mistreated in your name. Father, I ask that you just bless those who are in need. Continue to walk with them. Talk to them, love on them, encourage them. Give them strength. To continue the fight and to endure until the end. Father, I pray to you this prayer. I ask these things of you. I seek your kingdom and your face. I thank you for hearing my prayers and answering my prayers. And those of my brothers and sisters. And Jesus, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for loving us. To the point that you gave your life. On Calvary Mountain. In your son Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. And amen. Well, y'all, I want to thank y'all for joining me tonight. Guys, remember that God loves you. He always has and he always will. Remember, no matter what the storm and trial or tribulations that you go through, no matter what the enemy or this world throw at you, no matter what your family members, your wife, your husband, children, anyone throws at you, keep your faith. Stay on the path that God put you on. Keep your focus and your eyes on the cross and call on the name of Jesus and he will reach his hand down and pull you out of that pit you that you dug yourself into. Know that Miss Terry loves each and every one of you guys to the moon and back. I will see you guys tomorrow at 4 o'clock p.m. Y'all be blessed. Y'all be safe. Y'all enjoy the rest of y'all evening and good night.